Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphic so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. Today I want to talk to you about a familiar subject, that what will you do with Jesus? Why do I say that it's a familiar subject? Is because, you remember this, the haunting strands of the old time and time-honored invitation song. What does it say? What will you do with Jesus? Question comes to you, and you must give an answer for something you must do, either accept him or reject him. So what will it be? What will it be? Oh, what shall your answer be? What will you do with Jesus? Oh, what shall your answer be? I'm sure that you have heard that song many times in your congregations that we usually say it's an invitation song, that we sing a song at the end of a service to further encourage people to obey the everlasting gospel of Christ. Let's take a look. The Jews chose Barabbas. You know, in the first century, the first century Jews because of the urging of the high priests that they chose Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, was he someone that you would try to free from prison? You know, Pontius Pilate did that a purpose. He chose Barabbas. He thought, sure, they're not going to lose this man. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. So he's a murderer. Not only that, he's a thief. When they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. And John records that he was a robber. Mark says that he was a murderer and a robber. When you get all that information together, they couldn't possibly choose Barabbas, but they did. At the urging of the chief priests that whipped up the crowd, whipped them into a frenzy, what did they do with Jesus? They rejected him, and they chose Barabbas. I mean, a man that by all standards of justice deserved to die. But they chose him. And Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him, whom you call the king of the Jews? Their reply, Crucify him. Crucify him. That was the worst punishment that you could, that you could put on a man, is to crucify him. Here was the meek and lowly Jesus, the one that could have called 10,000 angels to come to his rescue, as he told the apostle Peter. But at the same time, he said, how then will the scriptures be fulfilled? He was willing to die a horrible and painful death so that he could offer salvation to you and to me. 
So what will you do with Jesus? What will it be? What will your answer be to crucify him? You know, <clears throat> in the Indian Creek youth camp days, I remember that the kids put on a skit. It was very powerful, even though that it bordered on fantasy because they were interviewing a person from another world. And this person from the other world was telling what a wonderful hero they had on their planet. And the young people, the Christians said, well, we have a hero too. We have a hero that could heal the sick. We have a hero that would feed the poor. We had a hero that could work miracles, make the blind see and make the lame walk. And they said, where is this hero? Where is the monument to this great hero of yours? We would like to know more about him. Where is he? And they would drop their head and said, we killed him. And you think about that for a moment. That was a powerful little skit that they put on. We killed him. The hero of heroes, the man of the ages, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we, the human race, killed him. The Jews whipped up the crowd and said, no, no, don't, don't release Jesus. Why, he's a dangerous person. Crucify him. Crucify him? That was one of the most horrible fates that a person could endure. Nail you to a tree, thrust a spear into your side, beat you almost to death before you get there with the flagellum. Yeah. Put a crown of thorns on his head, beat him overhead with a reed, strap his back until you expose the muscle and the sinew of his body and blood running down to his ankles. Yeah, that was crucifixion, Roman style. And I'll tell you something. The Roman soldiers would take pleasure in getting a hold of a Jew and doing it that way. Jesus was a Jew. Why? Well, they were having to occupy Jerusalem, Judea, what we would refer to as the Holy Land, they'd rather be home, wherever that might be, in Rome or some other place that is under Roman rule. They'd rather be home with their family. And because of the Jews, then they were having to occupy and keep peace. And they took pleasure in beating the Lord Jesus Christ and humiliating him in every way Crucify him. Crucify the greatest hero that ever lived upon the face of the earth. That's what mankind did. <clears throat> but the choices have consequences, doesn't it? Think about this. This was a terrible decision by the priest and the mob that they had whipped up. For in less than 30 years, their worst fears will become a reality because the predictions of Jesus about Jerusalem will come true. You remember on one occasion they were, his disciples were showing him the temple, how beautiful it was. I think Jesus had already seen it, but they were so proud. They were telling Jesus about the temple. And he said, the time is coming when there won't be one stone left upon another, I'll be torn down. And that happened. Because you remember, when Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, it's going to happen. I say to you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the Romans went in there and did that. <clears throat> Why would they do that? Well, of course, they were the conquering army. But I am told one idea was that the 
temple when it was set fire that the gold in there melted and seat between the rocks. And therefore, that was an enhancement. That was an encouragement for the Jews, or for the Romans, rather, to tear the temple down, and they did. Just think about that. The Roman siege began in 68 B.C. See, that's not far removed from 33 B.C. when Jesus died on the cross. Jerusalem fell in 70 A.D., led by the Roman general Titus. The famine inside the city was so great that a woman actually cooked and ate her own child. That's not in the Bible. It's in the works of Josephus. Ate her own child? She was that hungry. Just think about it. Three choices. Well, all of us know of these stories in the scripture, don't we? And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, incidentally, <clears throat> he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Because Paul surely had it along with the rest of the apostles and Christians everywhere. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and judgment to come, Felix was afraid, looking at his own life. And he said, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. That convenient time never came. You know, it's so often that you hear people say, well, well, when I get things right, just after a while, I have a more convenient time. I've, I've got to do some chores. My, my job is taking me away. And one of these days, that convenient time never came. He had the opportunity because he was taught about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. And Phoenix was afraid he wasn't going to do it. That's one choice. Now, as he, that was the Apostle Paul, made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, now, he was making his defense before Agrippa, King Agrippa. And I've always been amazed. He was not really making a defense for himself, but he was preaching the everlasting gospel. He was preaching the everlasting gospel to King Agrippa. Well, Festus was there, and he said with a loud voice, he interrupted Paul, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. In other words, you have studied so much and you know so much that you've actually become mad. I guess down south we'd say crazy. You're crazy when he taught about the resurrection, about Jesus. He said, you're crazy. Well, that's another response. There are people in the world today that do the same thing. There are people in the world today that think you Christians are crazy because you believe in the resurrection of the dead. Oh, it's true. Jesus was raised so that we might forever believe in the resurrection. And incidentally, if you wanted to empty each and every church building, Protestant or Catholic, you just wanted to eliminate it. You could prove one disprove one thing and they'd be turned into casinos what would it be if you can disprove the resurrection of Jesus if you could disprove that churches would close their doors forever sell the buildings make honky tonks out of them or whatever here's another one Agrippa said to Paul, 
you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And of course, another song is beautifully sung, almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive, almost cannot avail, almost is but to fail. Sad, sad, that true refrain, almost, but lost. There's no evidence anywhere that Agrippa ever obeyed the everlasting gospel of Christ. He'd heard it. He could not say on judgment day that he had not heard. A person whom Jesus loves can be lost. You know, we sang the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and he does. But here is a person that Jesus loved that was lost. Just because Jesus loves us doesn't mean that we are going to accept Jesus Christ as our hero, as our leader. Look at Mark, the 10th chapter. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus somewhat rebuked him because Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But he said, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. The young man proudly announced. Oh, he said, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. I've been taught and I've kept them. Here it comes. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing that you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven and come, take up your cross and follow me. That was an invitation for almost immortality here on the earth because we know about Peter, James, and John. We know about the apostles. He would have been named, but he goes nameless throughout the scriptures. We don't know who he was, but we know he made the wrong choice because, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's not a sin to be rich. It's a sin for what you do with it. And just think about the opportunity that this fellow had. If he had followed Jesus, surely he would have made him one of his apostles, wouldn't he? Surely he would have received the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Surely he would have gone out the world preaching the everlasting gospel, but he didn't want to pay the price. Something to think about, isn't it? How stupid can excuses be? There are three examples in the scriptures that I want you to think about just. And when he has said, a certain man gave a great supper. We know that's God Almighty and Jesus himself. And invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, because all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said, oh, I, I, I bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. There's not an entrepreneur in the world that will buy a piece of ground unseen. Well, he'd know. He'd know what it looked like. He would know that had been surveyed. He'd know exact boundaries before he even thought about buying it. No, I've got to go see that land. 
I asked you to have me excused. Another said, I, I, I bought five yokes of oxen, and I'm going to test them. That is so foolish. No one buys oxen that haven't been tested, that they haven't seen them under the yoke, whether they will run away or whether they will stand, whether they will pull. He wouldn't even buy one yoke of oxen, which would be two. He wouldn't even buy five, much less ten. Five yokes of oxen would be ten. Oh, I'm going to test them. I'm going to see if they'll work out. Hmm. Oh, yes, have me excused. Still another said, well, I married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Never will forget a member of my audience one time that he spoke out and he said, well, that one's self-explanatory. Well, I don't know about that. But anyway, how stupid can that be? So that servant came and reported these things to his master. The master of the house said, being angry, said, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And he said, well, master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. The master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. No use in changing their mind now. And coming up later wanting to get in. Not going to get in. They want to feed it to the poor, the main. <clears throat> the high standard of becoming a Christian. Now, not everybody's willing to pay the price. Great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me, and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, yes, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Bear the cross? If we were to put that in today's language, we'd say, and whosoever does not sit in the electric chair cannot be my disciple. It's a cost. Somebody says, the scriptures say, honor thy father and mother, and Jesus is saying, you got to hate them. No, it's not the kind of hate that we usually think of. It is to love less that Jesus comes first, comes first above father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters even his own life. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that you just grind your teeth and hate all these people. But to take up the cross, everybody knew what that was. Everybody knew what it would be to die the death on the cross. Think about this. <clears throat> Some excuses I have heard. Some have said, I'm not ready yet. Oh, I'm not ready, preacher. Just, just hang on. It's going to happen. It ain't going to happen. My parents were not members of the Church of Christ. Well, had they had the opportunity to study and to learn the everlasting truth, the gospel, don't you think they would have obeyed it? Why, well, sure they would have. My, mem my parents, and I just feel like that if I become a member of the Church of Christ, that I'm just, I, I'm just condemning them to hell. Uh, You've got to think different than that. Oh, I don't believe one has to be baptized. It's going to read the same way on the judgment when the books are open and one of them is the Bible. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Believe, baptize, saved. It's going to read the same way. And you can believe it or not. But my advice to you, you read and study it and believe. You know, I was christened 
are baptized as an infant. Really? To wash away your sins, an innocent baby that knows no difference from right or wrong, and you were saved by being christened and call it baptism as an infant? Won't work. Oh, here's a good one. I have a few things to get done before I obey. And never get them done. Never get them done. I've preached funerals where a person, that was his excuse. I have a few things I got to get done before I obey. Oh, boy. My job won't let me come to worship on Sunday. Well, get you another job. It comes with a price to become a Christian. I've been too wicked. I hope you never say that. Because you're flying in the face of God Almighty and Jesus who died for your sins. You think you can out the blood of Christ? All oh, you need to be taught. Oh, I will someday. Um, look on the calendar. Someday is never listed. Look at your watch. Sometime isn't on there. I want you to think about the pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hidden in a field. A man he found and hid it and for joy goes over and sells everything that he has and buys that field. The treasure is his. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price sold everything that he had so he could afford it. That's Christianity. And I give you our trouble with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven and his mighty angels in flame and fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and those who do not obey the gospel of Christ. You've got to obey if you're going to be saved. The gospel not only must be believed, it must be obeyed. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And you hear the word of the Lord gospel and believe. In flame and fire, he's going to take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of God. Our time is quick to get in the way. I really do appreciate you tuning in to the Seek and the Lost broadcast. Won't be able to get to the rest of this, but I hope that you'll study it for yourself. So what will you do with Jesus? Our God is an awesome God. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll-free, 1-800-390-7734.